this week on To the Contrary. First, Harvard Law professor Alan Dershowitz faces defamation charges involving a sex trafficking case. Then, an organization known for seeking justice for others faces charges of race and sex discrimination. Behind the headlines, the global gag rule's impact on women and HIV in Africa. Bay. Welcome to To the Contrary, a discussion of news and social trends from diverse perspectives. Up first, sex trafficking accusations going to court. Famed attorney and Harvard Law professor Alan Dershowitz is being sued for defamation by a victim of convicted sex offender and pedophile Jeffrey Epstein. Virginia Jufre says she was a victim of sex trafficking and abuse by billionaire Epstein, who forced her to have sex with Dershowitz and other prominent wealthy men when she was underage. She also says Dershowitz was a participant in the sex trafficking scheme. Dershowitz has called Jufre a liar and extortionist and says he's been looking for an opportunity to prove his innocence in court. Epstein has been back in the news because President Trump's labor secretary, Alex Acosta, recently came under scrutiny for a so-called sweetheart plea agreement he made with Epstein when Acosta was a federal prosecutor. So, Congresswoman Norton, have all the mighty fallen yet? Uh, Bonnie, uh, the Me Too movement has done a very good job, but I fear that most of the mighty who should fall have yet to fall. <laughs> I'll agree with that. It's done a good job, the movement, yeah. But there are so many more out there who've been bad actors like Jeffrey Epstein, ruined the lives of so many young women. So let's see what comes. I mean, we have a really big example to make of the Big Apple in, in the White House. So I think the mighty ha are just starting to fall. <laughs> and to that point, you know, Donald Trump and Jeffrey Epstein were obviously very closely linked. Trump faces a number of sexual misconduct allegations. Another friend of Epstein's who, lo who wrote his Lolita Express was Bill Clinton. And you think about it, he was astoundingly close to going back to the White House just two years ago. Well, and so was then still full-time Harvard tenured professor um, Alan Dershowitz. And it just, how did a guy like that have so many powerful friends? Didn't, uh, it, it just always... It never ceases to amaze me. What is it about people who think they can do these things, hang around, hang around with known uh, child yeah. abusers and think they can get away with it? Because it's about power. And also sexual assault and sexual crimes like this. I mean, a lot of these were underage child rapes that we're talking about. I mean, they're not partisan issues. You don't have to be a Democrat or a Republican, Clinton or Trump. Well, you know, well, that, 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 there's a little difference here between Dershowitz and... And, and and who loudly proclaims and you know sue me and 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 in other ways Dershowitz represented Epstein that may have been his fatal was flaw. his friend and yeah. on his legal team and on his legal team but he is a famous criminal lawyer yeah. so he is famous for representing bad guys mm -hmm. so now there's something of a retaliation lawsuit against him for from somebody who seems to have sued everybody from <laughs> <laughs> from <laughs> the prime minister of Israel to ambassadors to the United Nations so in order for us to maintain the credibility of the me too movement i think we ought to look closely at the allegations at the accused yes and at the accuser the loud proclamations of his innocence here uh and much more uh a dare you and I'm saying it again from one of the most important criminal lawyers in the country is something to watch here. So I'm not sure I'm going to put Dershowitz, and I should add this disclaimer, I do know him. He was in law school with me at Yale Law School. Uh, I, I'm not sure I put him in the same category uh, with the, the others given what has happened to, and I should mention, this young woman. Uh, may have been really damaged. I really feel for her. Uh, she was trafficked at uh, when she was 16 years old, mm -hmm. 
And so she is remembering what has happened to her over a, a long period of time. She doesn't live in this country anymore. She lives in Australia. Uh, and she may be getting back at people she thinks were coming at her, but she deserves our sympathy. Well, you know that old saying, you lay with rats enough times or something of that yeah, variety. I can't remember. Well, there's, an, um, there's another saying, though, too, which is the, from Shakespeare, the lady doth protest. And I just wonder if the man is protesting a little loudly in this case. Uh, That's just Alan's style. I mean, I don't know. You've known yeah. him for a far longer time, and I don't personally know him, but having watched him and, and not being acquainted with his past, I can just say it's who he is. This is how he comes out fighting and, and punching back. Um, it's just unfortunate. I, I'm just not really surprised to see the allegation. Uh, I would like to see it all hashed out in a court of law, of course, not in the court of a public opinion where somebody like Alan has a lot of, um, he get, got a lot of face time over this past two years. Let's not forget. So. Well, who's more credible here? Yeah. Uh, well, can I tell you something? I mean, birds of a feather, but also what, what do the people that you surround yourself say about you? And yeah. he is at a point where, I mean, he doesn't even, he feels sorry for himself. Do you remember last summer when he was like, I, I don't get even invited to dinner parties <laughs> at Martha's Vineyard? And it's like, we are talking about women's lives that you have ruined and he's worried about his social life so a, a point of privilege I, I can't even relate but that's because and he was representing people like Epstein so so you really got to and, and that's why I want to say make sure we don't take the Me Too movement and, and, and th through something that says that every time there's an allegation Dershowitz represents bad people this woman, let's look at her credibility as well. And I say this as somebody who, as I said earlier, wrote the guidelines, the sexual harassment guidelines. But to maintain credibility, I think for all of us involved, we need to say, well, why has she been, why has she been <laughs> accusing high people, people in high places for a long time? And that's what, what's going to happen in a court of law. Does that cost her credibility? Of course it does. That's going to be brought up in a court of law, and who is encouraging her to sue? And what does she think she can get? Money, right? That's what, she, it, wants. That's what she wants. That's Damages. Well, I think it's also important to dissociate Dershowitz's role as an attorney and his role as a private citizen. Obviously, we require a, a robust criminal defense system in order for this country to function, and you can't necessarily malign someone just because you choose to represent the worst people, you know, right? I know that Harvard is undergoing another scandal because one of the professors is is joining Harvey Weinstein's criminal defense team. And you can't malign someone for doing their job when criminal defense is an important part of the American criminal justice system. However, then there is the question of why was he hanging around Jeffrey Epstein all these years? He Maybe even, because he was he representing even, him. But, uh, but, <laughs> no, no, but in a friendly capacity, oh, he, alleges, he alleges that he received only a massage in, Ep in Epstein's estate. That sounds sketchy. And again, obviously, we believe in a semblance of due process, even in a court of public opinion. I think that we all sort of, when we're weighing these public evalu uh, allegations, we want there to be the preponderance of evidence that must be achieved before we immediately believe all women. I think that's sort of a hackneyed way that cheapens our, our perception of justice. But it is worth considering, you know, he submitted, he says that he submitted exculpatory evidence to the Miami Herald when they were doing the Yeah, he says he story. produced it. But he wouldn't credit let them card, hold on to it. Credit cards yeah. and travel uh, records showing he wasn't even yes. in the place where she said he was. But these haven't been made public, and he didn't allow the Miami Herald to keep any of the so-called exculpatory evidence. And I think that if we see it, and if it checks out, and, you know, that probably means that this allegation against him would not meet the preponderance of evidence. And you are innocent until proven guilty. Also, why are we being so much more scrutinizing of the woman and her past than of Dershowitz? I mean, isn't that completely going against the entire point of Me Too? I mean, isn't that what's so revolutionary about it? Is because that we're in gonna a court of law, you? you're going to look at both. And, and Dershowitz has a reputation for representing very bad people, so it's Im important to say, well, what ha wh why would she be doing this? And her, why would she be doing is, this is very important. This is why I'm very sympathetic, because this woman has not only been trafficked, she's been abused. On, on the other so hand... So you're saying that it, this has led to mental instability? I think that... And the why would charges she accuse, are coming Why would from she that? accuse so many men in high places of, of, of abusing her? I mean, that is, that is going to come out. Maybe because...
because Jeffrey Epstein was bringing them through. <laughs> the the, the His, prime minister yeah, of a lot of the prime minister of Israel. Give me a break. You know, but Netanyahu. <laughs> Netanyahu. He's yeah. such a criminal. <laughs> what about Berlusconi? But all, too. this doesn't go well. You know, a guy like Dershowitz stands to really undermine the entire movement because of his. Yeah. Uh, you know, because of his place. And so I, I really, I, I'm worried about it because, you know, look, it wasn't too long ago we learned about Robert Kraft and that, that Jupiter, Florida debacle. Uh, so there's, there's a lot going on. And, and I, that owner of that massage parlor was, I mean, had pictures with how many famous important people? All right. Well, you know, let's, it's all up so, and out and we'll see what yeah. happens in court. Let us know what you think. <laughs> Please follow me on Twitter at Bonnie Urbe. From sex trafficking to civil rights abuses. The Southern Poverty Law Center, or SPLC, a bastion of civil rights and arbiter of hate speech for decades, is in crisis. The organization that has cited hundreds of others for discrimination is awash in allegations of supporting a toxic workplace culture that underpaid African-American staff and had a sketchy record on sexual harassment. Last month, it fired its famous founder, Morris Deese, and its president, the board promoted one of its members, an African-American woman named Karen Baines Dunning, as interim president. We made repeated requests to interview her for this story and were turned down. Full disclosure, the SPLC has cited my work on its website three times, as well as on Twitter, for such things as interviewing anti-immigration advocates. We always balance our coverage with advocates for open immigration. So, Tiana, uh, the SPLC is, is the one that most of the media, liberal and conservative, but more liberal, go to to find out who's, you know, who's identified as a hate group. Meanwhile, they're running what has been referred to as a plantation mentality within the organization. What, is, what happens next? Well, I mean, so many of the people that the SPLC has maligned over the last few years have been people of color. They made Majid Nawaz, who is a Muslim reformer, Ayan Hirsi Ali, deem them anti-Muslim extremists. Um, they, they accused Ben Carson of being a symbol of hate. And I think this is, this is just sort of the chickens coming home to roost. And, you know, they say they're cleaning house right now. And who's the person that they hire to take over? Or Tina, put out front. They, they, they hired Tina Chen, who is Michelle Obama's former chief of staff, who's but the she's one gone who's, now. It, she, it, it, and I believe it's, um, you know, the, the woman they just, the African-American woman they just appointed from their board is, you know, is, it, is that going to lead to real change or is she a figurehead? I mean, it's, it just seems like they keep on sort of rehashing out the same mistakes. They keep on choosing figures who are not necessarily the least corrupt people to possibly manage it. And, and quite frankly, I think that those who, those who point fingers the loudest sometimes are the ones with the most grievances in-house. And that's, I think, what we're seeing with SPLC. Look, unlike the, the, the Dershowitz <laughs> matter, where there may be two sides, uh, there's no two sides here. Uh, Dees has resigned, so has Cohen, or the, the executive director. Uh, these people were double-dealing. That is to say, they were uh, going after people for sexual harassment, for racial discrimination. They were doing the very same things in-house. It's a terrible, terrible story because it's, it shows the hypocrisy or puts their organization uh, under the light of hypocrisy and therefore hurts the organization, which has been growing now for, for uh, um, 50 years or so. Uh, yes, it had a lot of credibility. It had credibility with the press. Mm -hmm. uh, it had credibility with, with Americans. And it had good credibility. And All some of that is undermined. outsized because in the 1990s, the Montgomery Advertiser, the news, their local newspaper, did a Pulitzer Prize winning series talking about just what's coming out now again and that, and that toppled finally at 82 was put out to pasture, so to speak. Yeah. Um, but this, these are not new allegations. What took so long? Um, I mean, it's a, it's a moment where you know, technology has shed light on a great many things and people feel empowered to come out, whether it's movements like Me Too that have, have led women, and particularly women of color, to feel safer and, and believed. Of course, up. of course. Um, but, you know, here's the thing. Uh, 
I just believe this was awful leadership all around and the way in which they're going about it now, they're tripping over their own two feet, which is the shame. For 15 years, I've looked at them as like yeah. sort of a beacon of light. And and that was the power there is that the work now, all this great work of all these years, Discredited. where's it all gone? But yeah. these women, well, but the a people lot of have it, been wrong. A lot of it, as Tiana mm -hmm. pointed out, was not great work. Yeah. It was, it, there was and it some of it. There are all kinds of, yeah, but who do the media turn to now? Yeah. Yeah. That's what I mean. Uh, it, that's it, what I mean. Where's our source? Yeah, completely yeah. discredited. You look for an organization that that not only has credibility, but has a bank of information. And I have a hard time trying to find a replacement. And I think that... ACLU maybe could step into that? It's, it's very duties. hard because because ACLU is, is, is multifaceted. It's huge, and, and it's, yeah. And multifaceted in its interests, whereas these people were focused right on the things that the press was most interested now, in and had the expertise. As a member of Congress, they had a bankroll of almost a half billion dollars because he did nothing but hard sell, hard sell donations, all the fundraise, fundraise all the time, yeah. free, uh, abusing his C3 status, which the IRS is now looking into. Um, that half billion dollars should it be uh, should the IRS allow them to use it to rebuild their reputation that's a hell of a, a heck of a lot of publicity <laughs> you can buy for a half billion dollars to make yourself look good Not again a or <laughs> should the money go to african the, the people the, it was originally set up to serve low income african americans in alabama and the deep south who need it look the only way to get at their riches is for somebody to sue them. The IRS doesn't have anything to do with this. Somebody has to sue them. They're going to have to pay. Uh, and that's where that money is going to come from. Now, who's going to sue? That's interesting. Yeah. I'm not sure I see plaintiffs uh, in, in this matter. That's what makes it even more, imp more the important. The news is its so heartbreaking to me, and especially in media. Like, they have done such great work. The reports are always cited. And, you know, especially their work with hate crimes, which have been obviously increasing since Trump took office. I just feel like anytime you cite them now, you're going to be like, you're discredited, and they're discredited, too. It's, the whole thing is very sad. All right. Behind the headlines, the U.S.'s role in halting the spread of HIV in Africa. Recently, a group of young African women advocates and health workers were in the U.S. to promote their successes and outline their challenges. Dreams is me, uh, a determined, resilient, empowered young woman uh, working towards an AIDS-free generation. These women are from Tanzania, Malawi, and Zimbabwe. Change, the Center for Health and Gender Equity, brought them to the U.S. with the goal of explaining the importance of HIV prevention programs in their countries that depend on U.S. funding. These advocates work at organizations that provide and promote HIV prevention for young women and adolescent girls, something that the U.S. government actually is doing uh, really wonderful work on expanding access to services. We're asking you to scale it up. Uh, we're asking you to expand the programs just beyond um, looking at adolescent girls and young women, but for us to also start focusing on young men and boys. DREAMS is a public and private partnership that is credited with producing a 25 to 40 percent decline in new HIV infections. That among affected communities of adolescent girls and young women in Africa. But it remains a major problem. For example, in Zimbabwe, 1.4 million people are living with HIV. We are seeing more and more that at such a large percentage of adolescent girls and young women hold that uh, statistic. So um, it, it's, it's a huge problem for us. More and more we're seeing within programs that we're, we, are, we seem to be moving far away from prevention and more to cure and treatment. To make their point, the young women shared personal stories about prevention and resistance due to cultural norms. I already have seen myself having different needs in different phases of my life. Abstinence to, uh, from sex worked for me. And then you get to another point in life where condoms really could work for you. As a young woman, maybe it's difficult for me to negotiate with another person on the use of condoms. Uh, our young women today do not choose when they're going to have sex or at times with who they're going to actually have sex. We need discrete options and self-initiated HIV prevention methods that do not force our young women to be caught up in these negotiations. The advocates lobbied members of Congress on Capitol Hill, stressing the value of funding global health. 
We really look to Congress to filling the, the gap and making sure that our, when it comes to global health, this is just such a small portion of, our, of the U.S. budget. While the young women told their stories, what they didn't or couldn't speak about was also striking. The so-named global gag rule bars them from even explaining restrictions on how they can use the funds and the impact on their work. The Trump administration reinstated the gag rule that blocks funding to any organization that provides abortion services or referrals or even speaks about abortion. The data shows that an integrated approach to sexual reproductive health is uh, an effective way to really make HIV prevention work and effective. Even President George W. Bush uh, issued a memorandum exempting our global AIDS funding because of the negative impact this policy would have on HIV programs. So because the young African women could not explain how the global gag rule affects them, yeah. Um, I'll ask you to please do it. Well, the global gag rule, which is also known as the Mexico City policy, is really an excellent example of a policy that would be completely unconstitutional in America, but which is implemented, of course, overseas. And it was so ironic during the course of this uh, panel, which I actually moderated, that any time the girls were asked, the women, the young women were asked uh, specific questions about the policy, they actually couldn't say anything because they would risk themselves from losing not only you U.S. financial assistance, uh, but also technical assistance, like computers and sonogram machines. So uh, it was so powerful because when you're living in America, and Americans, you know, they'll always be like, why do we have to give this much foreign aid? It's 1% of the trillion dollar budget. And we're stuck in Washington where a lot of these policies are made right here in Capitol Hill, but implemented and affect the health and rights of women and girls around the world. And it was so powerful to hear these women talk about the impact it's having on their lives, on the lives of their community members. And it also shows you, I mean, there's a huge power that comes with being the leader in global health. Sometimes I wonder why this president seems to have it so in for women. Yeah. I mean, this is yes. not about abortion. And yet he's cutting, you know, 1% of yeah. the budget. You want to cut something, cut cut U.S. social services, cut defense spending, which of course he's doubling or tripling it, but uh, you want to have an impact on the budget, cut cut something big. Well, the most important thing, if you're looking at the long-term budget projections, are Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. That's without a doubt. If you look at defense spending, it plateaus. If you look at our foreign aid, it plateaus. Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid are going to explode in the next few decades. Social Security becomes insolvent in the next 15 years. And I think that with regards <clears> to the <throat> pro-life aspect of it, I think that just given the extremely positive ROI, not just in terms of dollars and cents, but human lives with our with our foreign spending. Return on HIV, investment. Yeah. I think that it, just given that, if Trump really wants to focus on the idea of American taxpayers not funding abortions, which, you know, I think that it sort of does defy our notion of religious liberty, his efforts would be a lot better spent redirecting Title X funding towards non-abortion providers and then expanding it. Because Title X is a, an extremely effective program. For every $1 that taxpayers spend, we get back seven because we're helping women make good choices before conception. And, you know, we get back so much more than that. In Three years ago, I was in Ethiopia shooting a documentary on orphanages there. And President Bush, the, the George W.'s, Picture was all over the place. Name was all over the place mm -hmm. because of USAID mm -hmm. funding to prevent mm -hmm. HIV to to provide that HIV mm -hmm. drugs for free mm -hmm. to the that impoverished nation. Yeah. And China is out there in Africa going giving money away to all these countries, and they have completely, you know, uh, Cheap gotten drug, out yeah. ahead of us in terms of being a major mm -hmm. influence mm -hmm. there. This is one more way that we're going to lose standing in very important development countries. Okay, look, at this is an important element of, of foreign policy. Yes. At a time when we virtually are, are to the mm -hmm. point where we may have a cure for HIV AIDS. And these people are so far behind that the, the money that is cut off here is, 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 is particularly shameful because it could bring us back so much in funds and so much in goodwill.
Yeah, it looks Short, like the pendulum quickly. has swung, swung back, you know, and it, that's a shame. We we really need to be helping and get creative, like one of the young women was talking about from Zimbabwe, uh, about getting creative with boys and men, um, changing, helping change the cultural norms. And that's what these women are advocating for. So it seems counterintuitive, and I, I really do wish this administration would take a serious look and go back to Bush's policy. And it's not a part, partisan it issue. It doesn't have to be. George W. Bush was a hero on this issue. Well, let's not make any mistake. It's Mike Pence this is pushing this envelope. All right. Thank you. That's it for this edition. Please follow me on Twitter and visit our website, pbs.org slash to the contrary. And whether you agree or think to the contrary, see you next week. Mm -hmm.